I will introduce uh, Professor Harry Badesia. Uh, Professor Sir Harry Badesia, uh, he is the faculty member at the Department of Materials Science and Metallurgy uh, at the uh, University of Cambridge in UK. He is a Tata Steel Professor of Metallurgy. He graduated uh, from uh, City of London Polytechnic for the Bachelor of Science and got the PhD at the University of Cambridge. And uh, I think all the people here uh, has already know about uh, Professor Badesia and uh, I think I don't have to wait uh, too much. So please, uh, Professor Badesia, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you all for attending and to all the organizers because I know this takes a lot of work. So uh, I'm going to talk today about nanostructured steel. Uh, there have been very many attempts to produce nanostructured steel because a very fine crystal size uh, gives you high strength, but more importantly, a fine crystal size can give you a high toughness as well. And you know, you can't actually use a strong material without having toughness because it would not be safe to use. Now at the bottom of the slide, uh, you can see uh, a web, web page and uh, you will find a great deal of information about what I'm going to talk about in that website. And also there is a, a book which you can download completely free of charge, which contains all the information that I'm going to present today, okay? So if there's no charge, you can just download it freely. So first of all, I'll start off by showing you uh, the oops, sorry. Strange. Okay, here we are. So, sorry about that. Uh, first of all, I'm going to show you the strength that can be achieved in completely pure iron as a single crystal. Okay, so these experiments were done a very long time ago, uh, 1956, where we are looking at the strength of single crystals of iron. And you can see that uh, it's easy to achieve a strength of something like 14 gigapascals. That is an enormous amount of strength. Uh, the theoretical strength of pure iron is approximately 22 gigapascals. Now, what you can see more importantly is that the strength actually collapses as you increase the size of the single crystal. And the reason for this is that as you make your crystal bigger, the chances of finding a defect are greater. So here we have an almost perfect single crystal, whereas when you increase the size, you tend to get defects which reduce the strength of the material. So the strength of a single crystal will collapse when you increase the size. And you'll see later how this applies to, for example, graphene and to carbon nanotubes and so forth. They all suffer from exactly the same problem that as you scale up the size, the strength must collapse, okay? Uh, but even, even in this regime, the strength is actually very high. It's of the order of two gigapascals. So how do we make a material which is extremely strong and we, which we can produce in large quantities? Well, in this case, the strength collapses because of the higher probability of finding a defect when you make the single crystal bigger. 
But when we get into this kind of regime, it's possible to actually strengthen the material by introducing defects. So here, for example, is uh, a commercial material called cipher, which has a strength of five and see that it's extremely ductile. And remember what I said, that you can only use a strong material if it is safe in design. That means you need a fracture to be ductile and a process in which energy is absorbed. In other words, it must have done. And you stretch it out into two kilometers. That's the amount of deformation that has been put into this material to achieve a strength of five and a half gigapascals. And if we look at this material on an atomic scale, so this is uh, what we call a field, and basically are boundaries which have been introduced by deformation, cell boundaries. So by reducing the grain size to an incredibly small scale, length scale, you make the material strong. Five and a half gigapascal. And, and its strength is insensitive insensitive to size. Uh, this is the graph that I showed you earlier about single crystals, and you can see it's very sensitive to size. This is not. So again, this is uh, almost uh, 30 years old, and you can buy this material commercially. But the disadvantage of introducing strength by deformation is that you necessarily limit the form of the material. By form, I mean the shape of the material. So in this case, it is in the form of very, very thin wire. And just to show you, you know, the uh, length, uh, the dimensions of this, this wire is actually finer than the thread that we use in men's stock. The dimensions of a thread, the thickness of a thread is measured in terms of denier which is the weight in grams of nine kilometers of fiber. And men's socks are 50 denier, women's stockings are 10 denier, and the steel wire is nine denier, all right? So it's an extremely fine wire and it has its uses, for example, in cutting of semiconductors and so forth. But you clearly out of material lights. So, Whenever we introduce strength by deformation, we will have a problem that we can't get the shape of the object as we might desire. Now, many years ago, uh, carbon nanotubes came, uh, came, became a big news story. And the reason was that, you know, the strength of the 30 gigapascals, and this is essentially the strength of a carbon-carbon bond. So this is also the strength of graphene in the plane of the sheet. And the modulus is 1.2 terapascals. So that is six times the modulus of steel. So these numbers are extremely impressive. But unfortunately, graphene uh, for structural applications basically fall for the same reason that I explained earlier, that if I work out the free energy of a system as a function of the number of defects it contains, so this is, this is the uh, free energy of creating a defect, and this is the number of defects, and this term is a defect, actually favors the formation of a defect. And that is why it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, 
to obtain a perfect material when you have a large number of atoms in your system. So n is the total number of atoms in the system. Now, if I differentiate this equation with respect to the number of defects, then I can say that the fraction of defects will scale with the number of atoms we have in our system. And therefore, whenever we make a large material, it will not actually be defect free. And that is the reason why the strength of nanotubes here collapses and exactly the same graph applies to the strength of graphene. So there is no possibility of using either nanotubes or graphene for structural applications because the strength simply collapses beyond a length scale of about two millimeters. Now, there is another problem that we need to face when trying to use very strong materials. So imagine that we have a material with a strength of 130 gigapascals and a modulus of 1.2 terapascals. If I actually load that material to 130 gigapascals, then the amount of stored energy inside the material is greater than in dynamite, okay? And because the modulus is very large, the detonation velocity of a fracture would be much, much greater than in dynamite. In other words, your material, if you load it to 130 gigapascals, will fail explosively. So it's not a safe material to use because uh, once you break a carbon-carbon bond, there is no energy absorbed at all in the material. So it has more or less zero toughness in both graphene and in carbon nanotubes. So just to summarize, when we try to produce strength by deformation, the problem is that we limit the shape to wires or to very thin sheets. And if we attempt to make materials perfect, for example, the single crystals of iron or the carbon nanotubes or graphene, then thermodynamics tells us, very elementary thermodynamics that we teach to first year undergraduates, tells us that the strength will collapse as the size increases. And in the case of nanotubes and graphene, it's of the order of two millimeters. So we are not able to exploit the strength of any of those carbon materials, nor of perfect single crystals. So to summarize, uh, what I want to do is I want to design a bulk nanocrystalline steel, which is very strong, tough, and cheap. Now, this is very easy to say. So I want to explain to you what I mean by bulk and by strong and by cheap. So this is a picture that I took in the oil sands mines in Canada of a very large uh, truck for transporting uh, oil sands. And just to show you the scale, this is just one tire from that truck, okay? And that is me over there, so you can use that as a magnification marker. So I want to be able to make very large engineering structures out of any nanostructured steel that I design. Now, what do we mean by nanocrystalline? Well, uh, we've got to match the scale of a carbon nanotube, for example, when we talk about the crystals inside the steel. Uh, what do I mean by what do I mean by cheap? Uh, by cheap, I mean, look, we waste a lot of money in buying bottled water in plastic bottles, which are transported over long distances, whereas tap water is perfectly okay. So if you are willing to pay for bottled water, uh, then weight for weight or volume for volume, we need to make our material as cheap as bottled water because you are able to afford bottled water even though you don't need it. So these are my criteria for a steel which would be useful and with which we can make large engineering structures. Now I explained at the beginning that the reason why we want very fine crystals is because as we reduce the size of the grains, the strength goes up. And at the same time, we expect the toughness to go up because 
you will deflect a cleavage crack as it propagates across the nanostructure. But there is a problem uh, which arose from early research on nanocrystalline metals. And I illustrate that here. So this is a stress versus strain curve for, uh, for iron, which has a grain size of two micrometers. And this is the stress strain curve for iron, which has a grain size of 0 0.2 micrometers. And you can see that here we get a plastic instability as soon as we exceed the elastic limit. So this material would not be safe to use, okay? So the problem with getting very fine grain sizes is that you lose the ability to avoid a plastic instability when you pull the material. And that is because you lose the ability to work hard in the material. Plastic instability only occurs because the material lacks work hardening capacity. And the reason why we lose work hardening capacity when you make your crystal size very small is because dislocations and so forth, they sink into the grain boundaries and therefore you're not left with any mechanism of work hardening. So if you design a nanocrystalline metal, you've got to introduce somehow a mechanism of work hardening. And these are the four criteria that are essential if you want to make a nanocrystalline material which is useful. First of all, there has to be something which introduces a work hardening capacity. When you make the material uh, and you want to make large quantities, there will be some heat release by the material and you need to be able to store that heat inside the material. Otherwise, the temperature of your material will rise during manufacture and therefore you will lose your nanocrystalline structure. Uh, one way of uh, avoiding this heating problem, and we call this recalescence, is to reduce the rate of change during the process of manufacture. And I want to make this structure without any deformation. So I want to produce it by phase transformation. And the lower the temperature of transformation, the greater the chance of achieving a fine structure. So I'm going to create this structure by using a phase transformation, which minimizes the amount of heat production. It has a work hardening capacity and it transforms at a very low temperature. Now, how can we store the heat inside, of, inside the material instead of releasing it so that the temperature of the material rises? Well, there are many ways in which we can change the crystal structure from the parent phase, which is austenite in the case of steels, to low temperature phases, which are usually ferritic. Uh, one way is supposing that this is the structure of austenite, okay? So the atoms are arranged in a square pattern here. And I want to change it into a different pattern. In other words, I want to get a phase transformation. Then that can be achieved by a deformation which is driven by a free energy change, right? So notice that there is no diffusion required in this process. And that's important because we want to produce the structure at a very low temperature in order to get a very fine length scale. But if that happens, then there is a change in the shape here. We started off with a square and now it has become a parallel of pipette. And bear in mind that this is happening inside the bulk of steel. So there will be a lot of strain energy created, which basically reduces the heat of transformation. And so your steel doesn't heat up when the phase change happens. So this is a real effect. And I'm going to show you this uh, for the case of the austenite to bainite transformation. So this is a, a sample which is polished completely flat, right? And what you see here are austenite grain boundaries at a high temperature. And I'm going to allow it to transform into bainite. And you will see that the deformation that I illustrated in the previous movie actually happens in real life. So these are crystals of bainite forming, causing that deformation, and in that process, storing the enthalpy of transformation inside the steel, 
instead of releasing it as heat. Because if it was released as heat, then the steel temperature would rise quite significantly and you would not get a nanocrystalline structure. So focusing again on the bainite transformation, I'll explain to you in the next slide, the basic mechanism by which bainite forms, okay? So imagine that bainite forms exactly like martensite. That means there is absolutely no diffusion and you get a thin plate shape because that is the shape which minimizes the elastic strain energy. But bainite forms at a temperature where carbon can, can move. So very shortly after that martensitic transformation, the carbon partitions into the austenite and precipitates as cementite. And that is the structure that you observe as bainite. Now, I don't want cementite because I want to produce a very strong steel. And a very strong steel, if you have brittle cementite particles, they will reduce the fracture toughness. So I want to cut the reaction at this point, okay? So I want only ferrite and austenite in my structure. And it's very easy to stop the reaction from proceeding beyond this point. We add approximately one weight percent of silicon inside our steel that stops the precipitation of cementite. And we are left with a beautiful structure. This is just ferrite and carbon enriched retained austenite. So this is what it would look like, okay? And so these are extremely fine plates of ferrite. You can see the length scale here. They're about a quarter of a micrometer in thickness. And remember that the mean free slip distance of a plate is about twice the thickness. So effectively, these are crystals which are half a micrometer in size, uh, obtained purely by phase transformation. And in between those crystals, we have this austenite, and austenite has no ductile brittle transition. Okay, so this should help the toughness. So this is a composite microstructure created by transformation alone, no deformation involved. And uh, it is a nice combination of austenite and ferrite, which should give us the ideal combination of strength and toughness. But this is not a nanostructure, okay? Uh, having a thickness of a quarter micrometer does not give us the same length scale as a carbon nanotube, which is typically about 40 nanometers in thickness, right? In other words, 0 0.04 micrometers in thickness. So we've got to uh, do something to reduce the scale of this structure. I want to reduce the transformation temperature. Uh, this particular structure was produced at 400 degrees centigrade. Uh, transformation at 400 degrees centigrade, I want to go down even lower. Now, how can we find the lowest temperature at which bainite can be produced, okay? Now, we know a great deal about the theory of the bainite transformation. You can look it up in the book that I mentioned at the beginning. We are able to calculate transformation temperatures using thermodynamics and kinetics. And when I do such a calculation, and remember this scale here is in absolute uh, units, in other words, Kelvin, but this is room temperature, okay? Uh, so what this shows is that by changing the carbon concentration, I can actually produce bainite at room temperature as long as I ensure that the martensite start temperature is also depressed, okay? So this is the first ever calculation to show you that there is no fundamental limit to the lowest temperature at which we can produce bainite. Okay. So if I can reduce the transformation temperature to a very low temperature, I should get an incredibly fine structure. But there is a catch and the catch is the kinetics of transformation. So if I plot this in a different way, where I'm looking at the amount of time required to produce the bainite, then for room temperature, I would require approximately a hundred years to produce bainite, okay? Now, as an academic, I would like to do that experiment. And we started that experiment back in 2004, and it is scheduled to be completed in 
2104. And the sample is archived in the Science Museum in London. And you can see whether it has transformed or not by looking for surface upheavals. But of course, you would need to travel to London and that won't be possible for a few years. But 2104 is far away. So to be practical, uh, we designed a steel which would transform in about 10 days into, into bainite by phase transformation at 200 degrees centigrade. So we have our low transformation temperature <coughs> and that's achieved by increasing the carbon concentration to one weight percent. We have the silicon here to stop the cementite from forming. We have manganese uh, to ensure that high temperature phases don't form. And whenever you want to make a very large quantity of steel, it's inevitable that you will have impurities, all right? Because it becomes too expensive to make the material pure. And those impurities can harm a high strength steel by segregating to the boundaries and causing intergranular fracture. So we add this molybdenum to, to basically get her the phosphorus atoms, in other words, associate with the phosphorus atoms and stop them from segregating to the austenite grain surfaces. Okay, so we've got a very simple steel here. And when we transformed it at 200 degrees centigrade, uh, we obtained a nice structure here, which is a mixture of ferrite, bainitic ferrite plates and austenite. But this is nothing unusual, okay? People who work on steel will see a structure like this. The length scale here is 40 micrometers. But the important point is that this structure is isotropic. In other words, you will get the same properties in all directions. If I now look at an incredibly small region of this structure using uh, transmission electron microscopy, uh, then it might be misleading because it shows all the plates aligned in one direction. But this optical micrograph shows you that it's actually an isotropic structure in three dimensions, okay? Now, be ready for the next micrograph. It's, it's pretty spectacular. So here I have a carbon nanotube at the same magnification. And these are the plates of bainitic ferrite, which are just 20 nanometers in thickness. So they are finer than the thickness of a carbon nanotube, okay? And this is the austenite that we need because when we pull the material, the austenite will tend to transform into martensite and give you a work hardening mechanism, which is essential in order to obtain toughness and ductility uh, in a very fine scaled structure, a nanostructure. Otherwise you get a plastic instability which ruins the properties, okay? So we have a structure here, which is nanostructured, which can be made in very large quantities, large in all three dimensions because the phase transformation itself takes about 10 days. So that you can make very large components and just hold them at 200 degrees centigrade. The transformation starts in about a day. So all your material has reached that temperature, and then you allow it to sit there at the temperature at which you normally cook a pizza uh, in order to generate this structure. And I won't show you all the properties. They are archived in that book that I showed you earlier. But look, uh, we've got a strength of the order of uh, uh, between two and two and a half gigapascals, depending on where we, uh, what temperature we transform at. We've got ductility and we've got toughness K1C of about 40 megapascal root meters. So we can do some safe design. And now I'm going to show you some applications. So this is an aircraft engine and, uh, you know, the 10% of the weight of an aircraft is actually steel. Uh, people talk about light materials and so on, but there are many, many components inside an aircraft which cannot cope with things like aluminum, titanium, and nickel, we simply don't have the properties required. So this is the shaft of the aircraft engine, which is made out of steel. And 
What I want you to notice from this micrograph, which I took many years ago, and now the situation has changed that the aircraft engines are even bigger. Look at the size of this lorry and the size of this engine, okay? Now, civil aircraft engines are increasing in size. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, the Boeing uh, um, Max had problems because the engines are very large, so they tried to position them uh, in a place which influences the total behavior of the airplane, and therefore the software uh, misbehaved. The software that was used to control the position of the aircraft misbehaved. So the reason why they are large is because most of uh, the air doesn't actually go through the engine, but it bypasses and provides thrust, but it doesn't go through the engine. Something, something of the order of uh, 70 to 80 percent doesn't go through the engine, simply provides thrust. And there are advantages to that, which I won't go into. But what it means is that these fan blades in the front have to be very large. Therefore, the torque on this, uh, on this shaft also becomes large. And furthermore, if this fan blade breaks, that is a very major disruptive event. And the shaft has to be able to bend to temporarily accommodate the imbalance in the engine. Otherwise, the engine itself undergoes very violent vibrations and it can bring the aircraft down. So the properties required for such a shaft are very, very difficult. And we have been working to create those shafts out of this nanostructured steel. So these are actually shaft blanks uh, for a civil aircraft engine. Uh, and they are heat treated by, first of all, heating to 1,000 degrees centigrade, and then putting it into a salt bath at 200 degrees centigrade. And once it has reached 200 degrees centigrade, you just transfer them into an oven at 200 degrees centigrade to produce this nanostructure. And of course, there are other applications. For example, uh, armor. The material is also used in producing armor. But the very uh, recent, the most recent application by my colleagues at uh, Yansan University in China uh, is large bearings for, uh, for wind turbines. So these rolling elements that you see here, okay, are made from this nano, uh, this kind of nanostructured uh, vanadic steel. Okay, so now there are at least seventy different kinds of these nanostructured steel compositions for different applications. Uh, so this isn't exactly the same composition that I showed you earlier, but this is published work and you can look it up. Uh, the next stage in the in the project is to actually make the rings themselves out of this nanostructured steel. Remember these bearings uh, undergo contact stresses, which are of the order of two gigapascals, periodic contact stresses, okay? So as, as the bearing rotates, every time a rolling element goes over a ring surface, there's a contact stress of two gigapascals. So that's a pressure, uh, which is like a, um, a compressive stress plus a torque. So it's very exciting that this has gone into an application for something that is a very growing application, wind, wind turbines. Now, I've shown you some successful or partly successful applications, but notice something, all right? I want to now tell you the big problem with this material. Notice that, you know, if you have a shaft or you have armor, or rolling elements, or even a bearing ring. There is no welding involved, right? Because if you try to weld this material, it will crack spontaneously in front of your eyes because it has a large carbon concentration. So we cannot use this for applications which require joining. Uh, you can, in fact, join it with enormous difficulty, but that, that makes it basically I think it makes it basically useless in applications where you need to join to make an engineering structure. So we want to solve this problem, okay? 
Uh, there are applications which don't require welding, but there are many more which actually require welding. So we want to design a steel with an impossible combination of properties. So similar properties to the uh, nanostructured bayonet, strength greater than two gigapascals. We want a large ductility and we want a toughness and a choppy impact value at minus 40 degrees centigrade of 30 joules. It must be weldable, right? And similar criteria as the bulk nanostructured steel that I mentioned earlier. Now, how do we do this? Well, many years ago, uh, one of my students uh, did this experiment in a one weight percent carbon steel where he quenched to martensite and found these cracks in the plates of martensite during the quenching itself. So that means that as soon as you get phase transformation, you also get cracking. And this is an unmatched sample just to show you the cracks. What I want you to notice is that these cracks are more or less periodic along the length of the martensite plate, okay? And the reason is that there is a certain stress transfer length when you load the material. Uh, below a certain length of martensite plate, it's difficult to transfer stress onto a single plate. And that stress transfer length is this distance here between the cracks. So if I make my austenite finer, than the stress transfer length, then the plates of martensite will not crack and we will have a strong material which should also be tough. Now, I actually want to get to an austenite grain size of 0 0.4 micrometers. How on earth can we get an austenite grain size of 0 0.4 micrometers? And I want to make material in large quantities. Well, we have our thermomechanical processing uh, uh, system. These are your hot rolling, uh, um, hot rolling um, systems, which can give you deformation, which reduces the austenite grain size. And if you have a low finishing temperature, then the austenite will remain in a pancaked structure, which I will show you later. And we add a small amount of vanadium to stop the austenite grain boundaries from recrystallizing. So we designed a steel, I'll show you the composition later, uh, which has uh, 0.4 weight percent of carbon. That makes it weldable, okay? And I'll show you the uh, weldability later. But a very low finish rolling temperature. So your austenite grains are actually flattened enormously, okay? So this is the scale. And within the austenite grains, we have these deformation bands which reduce the size even further. And to illustrate this, I'm going to show you uh, electron backscatter diffraction from a single one of these austenite grains to show you the martensite orientations. And there will be a comparison against an undeformed austenite grain in the same material. So here, uh, the 100 pole figures of martensite in the undeformed austenite grain. And you can see there are uh, the expected 24 different orientations of martensite inside that single grain. But in the deformed grain, we have thousands of orientations of martensite. We made the martensite plates so fine, and because of the deformation gradients in the austenite, the crystallographic orientations are also different in space relative to your, the frame of reference of your steel. Now this means that you get a very high toughness because the cracks would be deflected frequently across this structure. And furthermore, it's difficult to transfer stress into, onto a single martensite plate, even though it has a high carbon concentration. So when you look at the properties, this is the nanostructured bainite that I showed you. This is uh, plotting the fracture toughness K1C and the strength. And this is our new material, which has much greater toughness consistently, okay? Produced simply by hot rolling, a low finish rolling temperature. Uh, it has uh, elongation and even choppy impact properties at minus 40 degrees centigrade. And we can weld it without cracking, okay? 
So in the first case, we obtained a very fine structure by phase transmission at a very low temperature. You know, at 200 degrees centigrade, an iron atom cannot diffuse to a distance of more than 10 to the minus 17 meters in 10 days. But in this case, we achieved an incredibly fine, severely deformed austenite grain size in which the coherent domain size is only about 0.4 micrometers. And therefore, the martensite size will be even finer. And we consistently get these properties. This has now been produced in many tons at Tata Steel. Now, one of the objectives of the original work was to see if we can produce something which can tolerate a very sudden distributed load, right? In other words, a blast. Now, obviously in the university, uh, we do the simulation of a blast in a different way. So this is our, our new steel here and it's clamped at both its ends. And we fire aluminum foam onto this to simulate a distributed load at a very high velocity. And I'm going to show you the movie. So first of all, this should not fail. And secondly, the deflection here should be an acceptable level of deflection, okay? So this is a simulation of a blast test. So that is the aluminum foam that was fired and the steel survives that blast, okay? Uh, the other applications that we've been looking at is wear applications. So this is a test done at Tampere University in Finland where these are our, our steel samples which are rotating at something like 300 revolutions per minute. This is a slowed down video in, in um, in a tumbler containing granite particles. So the granite particles hit the material. So you get impact and you also get abrasion at the same time. So it's a very severe wear test. And if I plot uh, the wear loss uh, for all materials in which exactly the same test has been used against the hardness, this is our new material. It shows a very low wear rate at a uh, hardness of around 500 to 550 vickers. And these are the commercial materials, okay? Now, if I do something to reduce the toughness of a, of a steel, then you can see the wear loss increases. What this means is that in, in hard materials, which we use for wear resistance, the toughness can be important when the circumstances involve impact as well as abrasion, okay? Now, these are laboratory tests and you don't really, uh, you know, they're very controlled tests with particular size range of gra granite and so forth. Uh, and they help us to compare against other materials that are available, but it's not like service conditions where there are so many more variables. So what we've done is uh, more than a year ago, we installed uh, this material into uh, a place within uh, an industrial plant where minerals are falling onto steel plates, right? And this is what happens to the steel plate, which is coated with a hard facing material here, iron chrome carbon uh, alloy coated on top of mild steel. After a while, you know, it just wears out completely. Now our material has been in service there for something like 18 months so far, and there is no visible sign of damage. Of course, this test needs to go on for many, many more, uh, more years, but we are optimistic. This is a much cheaper solution than coating the steel with hard facing alloys and uh, the coating process involves uh, deposition by welding and so on. So this is simply our steel from the hot roll condition placed in an industrial environment. Okay, so now I think uh, I've run out of time. So I'll finish with my last slide just to remind you that there is much more information available on this website and you can download this book from, from the same website completely free of charge to learn more about everything that I've said today. Thank you very much. So thank you, Professor uh, Badesia. So for the participant, please uh, us directly to Professor Badesia, just uh, unmute.
uh, or you can uh, write uh, on the chat box. Uh, maybe we have a question from, uh, can you read the chat box? Rob? Yes, I'm just opening it. Uh, so let me, let me. Um... Let me see. Maybe we have uh, two questions. Okay, so the first question is, uh, in the nanocrystalline materials, critical gain size is the main challenge, okay? Uh, and uh, smaller distance between uh, dislocation. In nanocrystalline pure copper or palladium, 20 nanometers is obtained, uh, you know, by severe deformation and the whole patch effect uh, doesn't work, work there. So deformation is controlled by grain rotation. But remember here we are talking about ambient temperature applications and the shape of the grains is like thin plates. And there is absolutely no grain rotation by movement of atoms in the grain boundary as you might expect in superplasticity. So, you know, in, in steel, in steel, you cannot get significant movement inside the grain boundary atoms, even at temperatures of the order of uh, 600 degrees centigrade. So in this particular case, there is no grain rotation involved. Does that answer your question? Okay, I'll assume it, uh, it does. Uh, so um, the chemical composition, yeah, okay. Uh, the next question is the chemical composition of this nanosteel. Now, the nanostructured bainite uh, composition I mentioned has one weight percent carbon and uh, about one uh, weight percent of silicon, about one and a half manganese and chromium, and a quarter weight percent of molybdenum. And you can find uh, a table of the compositions inside the book that I mentioned. Uh, because people all over the world are now working on this, there are actually 75 different compositions you can select for different applications. The other steel that I mentioned um, uh, at the end, uh, which has a very, very high toughness, uh, basically it's got a carbon concentration of about 0.4 weight percent. Uh, there's a nickel concentration of three weight percent and a vanadium concentration of 0.1 weight percent. And again, you can find this information on my website, okay? If you look under, under where. The next question is, do you have optimum formulation of the rolling reduction cooling rate during hot rolling? So, in the case of the martensitic steel that I mentioned, the most important stage is the final finish rolling temperature, which leaves the austenite grains in a, in a pancake state, right? And that has to be a low temperature by conventional standards. So it's of the order of 800 degrees centigrade. And when you say that, you know, people sometimes worry about the rolling load but in fact, you are rolling in the austenitic condition and austenite is not very strong at those temperatures. So it doesn't significantly change the rolling load compared with conventional materials. So the most important stage is the finished rolling temperature. The cooling rate, uh, we don't give any, any particular heat treatment to the material when it comes out of the hot rolling, the steel is designed to transform into martensite simply through the normal cooling process when it exits the hot rolling mill. Okay. So it has sufficient hardenability to, to do that. Someone's asking about corrosion resistance. Uh, both of these steels have no particular enhancement of corrosion resistance. They behave like an ordinary steel. They're not really designed for corrosion resistance. And the applications that I've mentioned don't require that sort of corrosion resistance. So they, they don't have any particularly exciting corrosion resistance properties. Now, um, 
where were the tests carried out on plates uh, of the martensitic steel. Uh, so we have produced the martensitic steel up to 12 millimeters in thickness. Okay? So we go from six millimeters to 12 millimeters. And because there are some applications, we are trying to get that down to two millimeters, which is quite hard to do with just hot rolling, but there might be a cold rolling stage involved in that, okay? So we've done that up to 12 millimeters thickness. Uh, the chemical composition I've already mentioned, and uh, the full details are on my website. Someone is uh, asking about high strength, low alloy steels, but that's a completely different class where you know the strength levels are usually below 700 megapascals, okay? Uh, or, or even, even lower, for example, the building steels uh, for high rise buildings would have a strength of only 400 megapascals because there is absolutely no advantage in having a high strength. You have to have a certain thickness for elastic rigidity, for example. Okay, so if you make uh, if you make a beam for a building out of very high strength steel, uh, I mean there might be many other problems, but first of all it will be very thin, and therefore you get deflection, okay, elastic deflection, just like an aircraft wings. You know when the aircraft is on the ground, uh, the wings will actually droop like this because of the accumulation of elastic strain along the length of the wing. In high rise buildings. That's a much bigger problem because the wind can make the building rock. Okay, so on my website, if you search for T101, the Type A 101 building, you'll see that from the 96th floor, they suspend a 90 ton steel ball, which is there to damp the vibrations of the building, without which you would get a one meter movement on the top floor. Okay, so now the movement is less than a millimeter because of the damping system. So you cannot exploit high strength in all applications. Uh, you know, bridges, etc. They need properties other than just strength and toughness. You know, the elastic properties also also matter. Um, so uh, some uh, there's a very good question on hydrogen embrittlement, and yes, the nanostructured bainitic steel. If you pump in hydrogen, it loses its uh, toughness, okay? So the sort of applications that we are dealing with, uh, you do not get that hydrogen embrittlement problem. But if you do, uh, for example, electrolytically charge it with hydrogen, then there is a clear problem like many other steels uh, which are strong, okay? The hydrogen embrittlement problem becomes worse as the steel becomes stronger. Um, okay, um, there's a question about introducing uh, fibers inside the matrix uh, by, for example, composite manufacture. Uh, there are many studies like that, but you are making the material expensive, okay? Very expensive to introduce fibers inside a steel, steel matrix. And there might be some applications for which that's necessary. For example, we, we make special alloys by mechanical alloying, all right? So we mix the iron and the alloying elements together with yttrium oxide. Yttrium oxide is, a, is a, like a ceramic. And then put it into a tumbler to mechanically alloy. And the reason for this is that the yttrium oxide particles um, are very good sites for the nucleation of bubbles when you irradiate the material with neutrons. So you generate helium inside the material and the smaller the bubble size, the greater the amount of helium the bubble can hold. So if you introduce lots and lots of yttrium oxide particles, then you can hold a lot of helium inside the material without the steel swelling up. So people are thinking, all right, of using this extremely expensive material in the fusion reactor program where the neutron flux is much greater than in the fission reactor program. Uh, fatigue properties, yes, uh, lots of fatigue properties have been studied, including the smooth tests. Now, in the case of uh, 
surface initiated fatigue in smooth tests, the material performs extremely well because you know normally the fatigue resistance increases as you increase increase the strength of the material. And people have also done uh, fatigue crack propagation, which will be uh, which will give you a value of the threshold crack propagation. Um, in other words, the initiation of crack propagation being uh, roughly one third of the total fracture toughness. Again, those, all those are reviewed in the book that I mentioned, which was only published in 2015, okay? Um, now, the problem, uh, so some, someone is asking, can we produce nanostructured bainite in a low carbon steel? Depends on what you mean by low carbon. If you say a weldable steel, it's not possible because we have to reduce the transformation temperature. Now, we investigated the possibility of using a low carbon concentration and increasing other alloying elements uh, like manganese to reduce the transformation temperature. But there is a fundamental difficulty uh, that the martensite start and the bainite start temperatures are predicted to merge, right? So you completely lose the bainite transformation. Uh, again, there are, that is discussed at length in my, in my book, but you cannot suppress the transformation temperature just by using substitutional solutes. So I think the best you can do is of the order of 0.6 weight percent of carbon. And there, within the list of 75 different compositions that people have been working on, you will find uh, something with 0.6 of a weight percent of carbon. The, the main factor controlling ductility in the nanostructured bainitic steel is the austenite. And what you need is that the amount of austenite should be sufficient for percolation. In other words, if I start inside the austenite at one point, I should be able to travel through the steel only going through austenite, right? Because once the austenite loses percolation, you are loading the martensite that forms from the transformation of the austenite, okay? And that martensite will be less tough than the austenite. So you need greater, the percolation threshold is about 10 volume percent of martensite. So you need to have approximately 20 volume percent of austenite in the structure to get sufficient ductility in the material. Now, um, someone is asking, what is the ultimate tensile strength that we could achieve in alloy steels? Uh, now, normally this is not not uh, a question an engineer would be interested in. They would present you with a basket of properties, okay? This is what I need. They will say, look, I need this strength, I need this toughness, I need this level of uh, corrosion resistance, fatigue resistance, and I need to produce in, in these dimensions. So it really depends on what component you want to produce. And what I would strongly suggest to everybody is that never start a research project just focusing on strength. Think about what you would like to do with it. It is very easy to produce something very strong without thinking about what other properties you need. And this is why graphene and nanotubes have basically fallen by the side in terms of structural applications. Uh, the previous talk was about functional applications. And I think that is where the future lies for these materials. Bulk metallic glass, uh, when you say bulk, uh, frankly speaking, you know, you can produce samples of the order of a golf club size, okay? But it is an expensive material. You know, you are producing metallic glass by adding lots and lots of solutes. And the same applies to high entropy alloys, which, uh, which are making a big uh, seen at the moment. So once again, if you look at what application you genuinely and sincerely think in your heart you're aiming this for, then you need to think about a basket of properties rather than uh, you know, just strength. So bulk metallic glass has a very specific advantage 
that the magnetic properties of iron-based bulk metallic glasses, you, know, it's, uh, the, you can get them extremely soft bulk metallic glass. And you know, that is very good for making things like transformers where you want to minimize your electrical loss due to hysteresis. So once again, you know, if you think about what application you want and what properties, then you may actually produce the uh, material that you really wanted. Have I run out of time now or should I carry on answering questions? I mean, there are three more questions. Okay, since no one's uh, saying anything. Um, maybe I think, Professor, I think maybe you should wrap up because there's a lot okay. of questions. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Thank you all very, very much. I enjoyed that. Okay. Okay. So thank okay. you, uh, Professor Badesia, for your uh, excellent and inspiring presentation. Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, I have uh, invited uh, you because I know uh, you are the expert on this uh, research topic. And uh, I'm sure that uh, all the participants uh, agree that uh, you are a, a very good uh, teacher in this uh, uh, seminar online. So that's why I, I'm really happy to have you here uh, to have uh, also Dr. Michael and Dr. Nasar because uh, all the people, especially in my country, they they uh, they need to uh, to know or to read uh, more about uh, the expert in metallurgy, for example. And one of the best example is uh, Professor uh, Badesia. Thank you very much, and thank you for organizing this. Okay. Thank you, and uh, I'm sorry because the streaming is not go to your uh, account, but to my uh, department uh, YouTube. So I will send the, uh, the record to you and to Dr. Uh, Nasar Ali. Thank you okay. very much, Professor. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nasar Ali and Dr. Mikhail, and uh, to all the participants. Thank you very much. and. Uh, okay. Good afternoon in Europe and good uh, night in uh, Indonesia. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Yes, thank you very much. So it was uh, very interesting to. Yeah. to have this exchange and also I had some ideas on this steel because it's always good to listen to mm -hmm. other topics because then you get something mm -hmm. and so on. And if there are any things which are uh, followed up, mm -hmm. uh, if there are interests or ideas and so on, on the research or, or the innovation exchange, okay. like in Europe we have some tools and things which can be uh, used as experience and then you, you have your own, which are you, you are a bit, uh, using mainly, but one can always pick some ideas from other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, the Dr. Michael, once again. And for sure, uh, I will contact you uh, in the future because uh, especially in my department, uh, I, I, uh, I try to motivate my colleague to to initiate uh, a collaboration between our department and uh, uh, another colleague in Europe, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, great. So uh, thank you very much again. Uh, I will uh, close uh, this uh, Zoom meeting in five or 10 minutes. So if you need uh, the e-certificate, please fill in the Google form, and then we will uh, send the e-certificate to you, and maybe to uh, Dr. Mikhail, and I, I, and I will also uh, ask to Professor Badesia, if you don't mind, please uh, send uh, us uh, your uh, PowerPoint by email, so the participant will get the e-certificate and also the uh, the PowerPoint uh, of the speakers.
So please don't forget to uh, fill in the Google form and I'm waiting uh, in five or 10 minutes before I close this uh, Zoom meeting. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.